If you're a follower of Jesus, if you repented of your sins, you've put your trust and faith in Jesus alone as Lord and Savior, I've got a question. Do you belong to Jesus because God chose you? Or do you belong to Jesus because you chose God? The answer, of course, is yes. The Bible says both are true. No one becomes a child of God without choosing for themselves to trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for them when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. But that's not the whole story. The Bible also says that God chooses us from before the foundation of the world. The Bible says God elects us to be saved from our sin. God predestines us to be adopted into his family. So which comes first? Does God choose us because we first choose Jesus? Or do we choose Jesus because God first chose us? With whom does saving faith begin? With God or with us? Does the seed of our salvation first sprout in God's heart or in our hearts? That's the question that Romans chapter 9 answers. And in fact, I am convinced that Romans chapter 9 answers the question with absolute clarity. However, I have to confess that probably the majority of professing Christians would disagree with that statement. And that's why Romans 9 has become one of the most controversial chapters in the Bible. Personally, I think it's unfortunate that so many believers cringe with embarrassment at the sound of good biblical words like election or predestination. It's even more unfortunate that so many professing believers actively avoid the topic when the Bible clearly does not. And I must confess, I was tempted to avoid the topic too. Even now, I suspect some of you are tempted, or you soon will be tempted, to respond negatively to this message. Some of you may decide at a certain point to simply tune me out. I'm asking you not to. I'm asking you not to tune me out, because what the Bible says about election is critical to your understanding of God, and it is critical to your understanding of grace. And it's critical to the assurance of your salvation in Christ. What the Bible says about predestination is also critical to your witness and my witness for Jesus. So that said, let's consider the context of Romans chapter 9. In the first eight chapters of Romans... Paul has presented the gospel to us in all its glory. Paul has shown us that salvation from sin and God's gift of eternal life comes to us by grace alone, through faith alone in Jesus. Now in Romans chapters 9 through 11, Paul raises a question regarding the salvation of God's Old Testament people, Israel. You see, in Paul's day, as in our day, relatively few Israelites were choosing Christ as their Lord and Savior. Few Israelites were being saved. And that led Paul to ask this question. Does the fact that so few Israelites are being saved, does that mean that God's Old Testament promises to Israel have failed? And Paul begins to answer that question in Romans 9, verses 1 through 13. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. Follow as I begin to read in Romans chapter 9, verse 1, where Paul speaks as an Israelite 
about the Israelites. Romans chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. Paul writes, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belongs the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all the children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. Not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise says. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. In Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, Paul begins by expressing his deep personal grief over the reality that the great majority of his Jewish brothers and sisters were lost. Paul anguished over the fact that his fellow Israelites were outside of Christ and headed for an eternity in hell. In fact, Paul's love for his fellow Jews ran so deep, he even declares his willingness, if it were possible, to suffer hell in their place. Which is, of course, exactly what Jesus had already done for them and what Jesus has already done for you and for me. Do you understand what Paul is feeling here? I think you do. You know what he's feeling because his anguish is at least at times your anguish too. Because if you're a Christian, aren't there times when the burden you feel for a lost child, the burden you feel for a lost parent, a lost spouse, it weighs on you like Paul's burden for the Israelites weighed on him. Aren't there times when God moves us to grieve over the multitudes who die without ever hearing the name of Jesus Christ? We're going to come back to these three verses of Romans 9, these first three verses. But now we need to hear how Paul answers the charge that Israel's rejection of Christ somehow means that God's Old Testament promises to Israel have failed. Listen again to how, how Paul answers that charge in verses 6 and 7. Regarding Israel's failure to embrace Jesus as Messiah, Paul writes, but it is not... It is not as though the word of God has failed. For not 
all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Do you understand what Paul is saying here? Paul says that the physical descendants of Abraham and the spiritual descendants of Abraham are not one and the same. Paul says that true spiritual Israel has never included all the physical descendants of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. It's never included them all. Paul says that from among the descendants of Abraham, God has always sovereignly chosen, God has always elected a smaller group of people to be his own. And that's the point of most everything Paul writes all the way through verse 29 in this chapter. Now right here I will stop and I will acknowledge that most people are offended by this suggestion that God sovereignly chooses some individuals to be saved while at the same time leaving others to suffer the eternal consequences of their sin. Wouldn't that make God unfair? Wouldn't that make God unjust? Wouldn't that make God some kind of a monster? I've got good news. Paul's going to deal with that issue next week. <laughs> next Sunday, Paul's going to answer this question that he poses in verse 14. Is there injustice on God's part? But he's not going to answer it today. Today, we're going to stay focused on the fact that it was God who made the first move in our salvation, just like God made the first move in Isaac's spiritual life and in Jacob's spiritual life. Today, I want us to understand that the seed of our salvation rests in God's heart before it ever rests in ours. In other words, the seed of our salvation is God's sovereign choice. So why does God choose the people He chooses to be a part of His kingdom? And why does God pass others by? Well, according to Paul, we can find at least a partial answer to that question by considering God's choice of Isaac over Ishmael and His choice of Jacob over Esau. So listen once again to Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 13. Regarding the Israelites, Paul says, verse 6, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. By considering God's choice of Isaac over Ishmael and his choice of Jacob over Esau, we discover 
that when God sovereignly chooses to save, he does it without human prejudice. In other words, God doesn't choose the people he saves according to human standards. When God sovereignly chooses to adopt a man, adopt a woman, adopt a child, his choice is never based on some special quality related to who that person is, where that person comes from, or what that person does. For instance, from the example of the Israelites, we learn that God's choice to save someone is never governed by their ethnicity or by their family origin. That's what Paul means in verses 6 and 7, where he says, For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And so in verse 8, Paul concludes, this means, this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. See, most Israelites, we saw this in chapter 2 of Romans, most Israelites in Paul's day believed that God was obligated to save them because Abraham was their physical father. Because they were ethnic Jews, most Israelites believed that their election was certain. And Paul says they were wrong. God is not bound by human expectations. His choice to save is not based on ethnicity. And Paul makes it clear that in the end, it really doesn't matter who your daddy is. In the same way, God's choice to save someone is never governed by religious privilege. See, this is another truth Israel did not understand. No nation on the face of the earth ever enjoyed the religious privilege that Israel enjoyed. Verses 4 and 5, Paul lists some of those privileges. Speaking of the Israelites, he says, to them belong the adoption. They were chosen, a chosen nation from among all other nations. To them belonged the glory. They had the presence of God dwelling with them in the tabernacle and in the temple. They had the covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant made with David, and the new covenant promised in Jerusalem. They were given the law. They were given the proper way of worship through sacrifice in the temple and the tabernacle, and they were given promises. To them, Paul says, belonged the patriarchs. And they, as a race, had the honor of being the race from which the Savior, Jesus Christ, came. In other words, God revealed himself to the nation Israel like he had never revealed himself to any other nation before. But does this offering of religious privilege that God gave Israel, did that obligate God to save every single Israelite? Well, they thought so. But again, Paul says the Israelites were wrong. They were wrong in the same way you and I are wrong. If we think growing up in the church under the teaching of Scripture obligates God to save us. It doesn't. When God sovereignly chooses to save, He does it without human prejudice. And that means that God's sovereign choice to save you isn't governed by your ethnicity. It is not governed by your family of origin. Neither is it governed 
by some real or imaginary religious privilege you may think you possess. And God's sovereign choice to save certainly is not governed by anything you have ever done in the past, anything you are currently doing in the present, or anything you will do in the future. If you hear nothing else today, at least hear this. God's choice to save someone is never governed by their works. Romans 9, verses 10 through 13. Paul could not be more clear. Paul says, And not only so, but also, when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, had done nothing in order that God's purpose of election might be, might continue, not because of what? Not because of works, but simply because of his call. She, Rebecca, was told, on the basis of God's election, apart from works, the older will serve the younger. So why did God choose Jacob over Esau? Was it because Jacob was obviously a more righteous man? If you think so, go back and read Genesis. Did God choose Jacob because of his good works? For that matter, did God choose Jacob because God looked into the future and saw that Jacob would in fact put his faith in Jesus someday and Esau wouldn't? All I can tell you is that is not what the text says. The text says, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, she was told the older will serve the younger. When God sovereignly chose or when he chooses to save, he chooses without human prejudice. God's ways are not our ways. God doesn't choose to save anyone based on their ethnicity or on their family origin. God does not choose to save anyone based on their religious privilege. And God does not choose to save anyone based on their works or even their future faith. Well, that raises the question. How then does God choose the people he saves? Well, we just read it in verse 11. Romans 9, verse 11. God sovereignly chooses the people he saves according to what? His own purpose. His own purpose. And if God elects the people he saves according to his own purpose, we can be sure of this. No matter what it seems like to us, God's choice of who to save is not random. It's not random. Our God is not a random God. The Bible says he is a God of order. And if he is a God of order, then God has a reason for calling every person he elects to be saved. It's just that he hasn't shared that reason with us. God has his own purpose for choosing who he does. And one day we will understand his purpose. In the meantime, we simply are called to trust that every choice God makes is just, it is loving, and it is wise. It is wise. I understand that the truths of Romans 9, and we've just really introduced those things, I understand they're difficult truths. Actually, once you grasp them, they're amazingly encouraging truths. 
But I still know that the doctrines of election, predestination, and the absolute sovereignty of God and salvation, it's offensive to some. And I also understand that most of the questions you want to ask me right now will, for at least a week, go unanswered. I hope that some of your questions will be answered next Sunday when we look at verses 14 through 29. But I have to be honest. Some of our questions won't be answered until Jesus comes. For now, I just want us all to understand that the seed of our salvation is God's sovereign choice. I want you to know that the Bible clearly teaches that God chose you before you chose Jesus. It wasn't the other way around. And in fact, it can't be the other way around. Just think back to Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Remember what it says? Speaking of all of us, speaking of the whole human race, Romans 3.10 says, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. No one seeks for God. Do you believe that or don't you? Because if you believe that it's true that no one seeks for God, how is it possible for any of us to choose Him unless He first chooses us and draws us to Himself? The answer to that question is it is not possible. It's not. Still, I know that some are struggling. So let me see if I can help a little bit. Let me share with you three things that the doctrine of God's sovereignty and salvation does not mean. Three things the doctrine of God's sovereignty in salvation doesn't mean. First, The doctrine of predestination doesn't mean that human choice is irrelevant or that personal faith in Jesus is not required. It doesn't mean that. Because the same Bible that teaches predestination also teaches that salvation comes only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. You have to make a real choice to repent and trust Jesus for yourself. And apart from that choice, you cannot be saved. More than that, you cannot blame God if you refuse to choose Christ. So first, predestination doesn't mean that human choice is irrelevant or that personal faith in Jesus isn't required. Second, God's sovereignty in salvation does not mean that people who really want to be saved won't be saved because God didn't choose them. God's sovereignty doesn't mean that people who really want to be saved won't be saved because God didn't choose them. Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That invitation is sincere. Anyone, anyone who desires Jesus may come to Him with absolute confidence that He will receive them. Third, God's eternal purpose in election doesn't mean that evangelism and prayer aren't necessary. God's purpose in election does not mean that evangelism and prayer aren't necessary. Think back to the first three verses of this chapter. The burden Paul feels for his fellow Israelites 
in verses 1 through 3 and the prayers that Paul says he prays for the Israelites in chapter 10, verse 2 are the very means that God uses to call His elect to Himself. That means the burden you feel for the lost, the prayers you pray on their behalf, and the testimony about Jesus you share. These things are all essential to God's saving work because God has determined in His mercy not to bring His chosen to Himself apart from you and me and our involvement. So now that I've told you what God's sovereignty and salvation doesn't mean, let me tell you at least some of what it does mean. First, God's sovereignty in salvation means we really are saved by grace alone. Grace alone, beginning to end. If God did not graciously choose each of us, guess how many of us would have chosen Him? Zero. If God didn't graciously choose each of us, we would forever remain incapable of choosing Him. Second, because God first chose us, we can be certain of our salvation. We can be certain of our salvation. That's why Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, He who began a good work in us, who's that? God. He who began a good work in us will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Those whom God calls to Himself, He will forever keep for Himself. You can be certain of your salvation because God chose you before you chose Him. Third, because God is sovereignly drawing lost people to Himself, we can be confident when we evangelize and when we pray for the lost. Think about that. Because God is already working because God is already calling people to Himself, we can know that when we share Jesus, people are going to come because God's already gone ahead of us. People are going to come. And finally, because God is sovereign in our salvation, pride has no place in a believer's life. Pride has no place in a believer's life. Instead, we stand before God as believers filled with a humble sense of wonder that He chose us. That He chose us to belong to Him in spite of who we are, in spite of what we do. And so we praise and we worship and we give thanks to the God who saves us because we know that those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He glorified. Oh God, how gracious You are to have chosen the likes of us when we had no hope of ever choosing You. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.